thank you all for taking your time to be here and for those of you on uh, streaming. Uh, <clears throat> this is a wondrous time of year as we get ready for Christmas. You know, one of the great challenges to my faith, and maybe yours, is the profound sense at times uh, of the seeming absence of God. Uh, where is God? Um, that's, a, that's a question, it's a doubt, and it's often cast as a challenge uh, to our face, uh, particularly in times like these, times of suffering. David faced such challenges. In Psalm 42, he says, My tears have been my food day and night, while men all day long say, Where is your God? Uh, have you ever struggled like that? Wondering, where is God? What is he up and about and doing? Why all this evil, this violence, this injustice, this sickness and death? Well, Matthew's genealogy is really one way that Scripture answers that question for us. Where is God? And what Matthew is saying here is, here's God. This is what God is up and about and doing in the lives of men and women in history. God is up and about keeping his promises. So listen now as I read to you. Uh, the Gospel of Matthew, the very opening genealogy, verses 1 through 17. Hear now the word of the living God. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. And Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram. And Ram, the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab, the father of Nation, and Nation, the father of Solomon. And Solomon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. And Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. And Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, and Abijah, the father of Asaph, and Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, and Joram, the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah, the father of Jotham, and Jotham, the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. And Manasseh, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers, at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Sheatiel, and Sheatiel, the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel, the father of Abiud, and Abiud, the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim, the father of Azor. And Azor, the father of Zadok, and Zadok, the father of Akim, and Akim, the father of Eliad, and Eliad, the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar, the father of Matan, and Matan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon, <clears throat> from the deportation to Babylon to Christ, 14 generations. And so ends the reading of God's word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as you cause the sun to rise and shine on us this morning, so by your spirit may your son, Jesus Christ, Christ our King, rise and shine in our hearts and minds that we may love you more and glorify you better. Amen. Amen. Matthew's genealogy tells us three things about Jesus of Nazareth. 
It says that he is the promised king, the Christ. It says that Jesus is the king that came to save sinners and that Jesus is the king of new beginnings. So I want to take each in turn to the question, who is Jesus of Nazareth? Right off the bat, Matthew answers first, Jesus is the Christ. He says this three times, verse 1, 16, and 17. And particularly in verse 16 and 17, he wants to make sure that we know this is not Jesus' last name. Jesus Christ is not his, Christ is not his surname. No, it's a title. It means anointed one. And of course, this is necessary because in Jesus' day, as we know, Jesus was a very common name for many boys in first century Judaism. So the problem that Matthew has is, which Jesus are you talking about? And he's saying, this Jesus is the Christ, right? This Jesus of Nazareth, Mary's son, Mary who was the husband of Joseph, This Jesus is God's promised Christ, the anointed one, the son of David and the son of Abraham. And think of that. This is the Christ the Lord God promised our first parents, Adam and Eve, in the garden, that he would send a savior. And it is this Christ who stands at the very center of the story of this book. Truly, the Bible is the book of the Christ of God. Now, the second thing we learn about Jesus is that he is the son of Abraham. And this name is also repeated three times, verse 1, 2, and verse 17. Who is Abraham? Well, Abraham lived 2,000 years B.C. And he came from the city of Ur of Sumer in modern-day Iraq. Some scholars say that Ur was probably one of the largest cities in the world at the time. And yes, that means that Abraham wasn't a Jew. Abraham and his family were pagans, idolaters. They worshiped other gods, most likely the moon god. And yet the Lord God, the creator of the moon and the stars and the sun, is also the redeemer of idolaters. And he redeemed Abram and called him out of her to go to the promised land. And Abraham did. He did nothing for this. He simply believed God's promise, and God, we are told, justified him, accepted him, forgave him. Yes, Abraham. Abraham was saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, in accordance with Scripture alone. And that is why the Apostle Paul in Galatians 3.8 says, Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. Now let that sink in. Let it really settle in our minds today. Did you hear that? Maybe you're from China. Maybe you're just across the border. You're from Jerusalem. Uh, Excuse me, New Jersey. (laughs) Maybe you're from Brazil. Maybe you're from the Congo. Maybe you're right here in Philadelphia. Wherever you are now, 4,000 years ago, the Lord God was already up and about and working for you on your behalf to save you through the Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And that gospel that was announced to Abraham 4,000 years ago and a half a world away, is now proclaimed here and throughout the world. That's why we're here. Westminster itself is a fulfillment of that promise as we seek to equip and proclaim the gospel and send men and women throughout the world to proclaim the gospel of Jesus the Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And now throughout the world, followers of Christ are made up from every country and of every kind, former Buddhists and Muslims and Jans and Confucians, former atheists and Hindus. Now they're all coming 
and being saved by this Christ, this Jesus, the son of Abraham. Of course, Matthew tells us more, doesn't he? He says that Jesus is also the son of David. In fact, if you look at verse 6, he just doesn't say David. He says David the king. You see, God had promised Abraham that from him would come kings, Genesis 17, 6. And David is a son of Abraham, a descendant of Abraham. And he was indeed a king. And a special king, for God the Lord had promised David in 2 Samuel 7 that one of his descendants, one of David's descendants, would sit on his throne and be the king of kings and the Lord of lords forever and ever. And some 250 years thereafter, the Lord raised up Isaiah the prophet, who foretold that this son of David would be this kind of king. He says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end, and he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And the zeal of the Lord God Almighty will accomplish this. What is Matthew's genealogy? What are we seeing? It's the zeal of the Lord accomplishing his will. His will to send the Christ, the son of David, the king of kings, the son of Abraham. And as King Christ has come, and he has come to end all earthly kings and kingdoms. He comes to lift the downtrodden, to protect and defend and provide for his people. And he comes as a conquering king to destroy the devil's work. Yes, sin, sickness, and death. And he does it all by way of bearing the cross. Our Lord's righteous life his atoning death, his justifying resurrection is how this king wins for us a brand new world. And this king will come again. And he will restore and recreate a new heavens and a new earth. And for all who follow him, we will be given new bodies, resurrection bodies, and it will be a new heavens and new earth where righteousness will dwell. So let us take that to heart. Is that not something to rejoice in? Christ is king. And because he's king, this king compels us to ask, who is your king? Who rules in your heart? Is it this Jesus? Is Jesus the king, the one who's ruling now your time, your money, your resources, your friendships, your desires, your words, feet, and hands. Oh, let it be Jesus the King. Now, Matthew has much more to tell us. He says not only is Jesus the Christ, the King, the promised King, but he's the King to save sinners. And indeed, isn't that what we have found here? For many of the names that we have just read, it is but a record of the folly of faithless men. Foolish men who ran from God instead of to God. Reminds me of uh, most famous, or maybe better, the most infamous running games in the history of college football. It was the Rose Bowl. UC Berkeley Golden Bears were playing Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena. And the name that would go down in infamy was the name of UC Berkeley's captain, Roy Rigels. Midway through the second quarter, Georgia Tech's Stumpy Thompson fumbles the ball, and Rigel is right there, and he picks it up, and he runs. 
and he runs with all his heart. He runs for 69 yards until finally he's tackled at the one yard line of his own goal. <laughs> That's right. Rigels had run 69 yards in the wrong direction. What a loss. What a fool. But listen, isn't that the history of God's people? David passed God's promise to his sons, and like fools, so many of them ran in the wrong direction right into Babylon. Must we tell of Solomon? Here his name is mentioned. Solomon's idolatry and marriage to foreign women. Or of Rehoboam's tyranny, which led to David's kingdom being divided. And what about Ahaz, the son of David who sacrificed his own sons in the fire to foreign gods? And then we have Manasseh. Of this son of David, it was said he did more evil than the nations the Lord had destroyed before the Israelites. Do you see now the names in Jesus' genealogy are not the names of the great and the faithful, but the names of the many faithless, men who ran from God, and yet despite their faithlessness, the Lord God remained ever faithful. The Lord remained true to his promise. He would send the Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David, the savior of the world. Here in Matthew chapter 1, verse 12 and following, after the exile, look at those names, the names of obscure men. Is this not the stump of Jesse? Here is Israel limping, seemingly forsaken. Here are the names that we don't know, Abayud, Eliud, Eleazar, Matan, Jacob, Joseph. Yet God kept his promise alive. Like a little flame flickering in the wind, God's promise seemed all but extinguished. And then there was Mary, a young peasant girl of the little and obscure village of Nazareth. Yes, this is the one of whom the prophets foretold. A virgin will bear a son and call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, Mary conceived and gave birth to a son, the son of David, the son of Abraham, even the son of God in human flesh. And his name was called Jesus because he would save, he would save his people from their sins. Jesus is the name of God's grace. Lest Jesus is the name of God's grace. And let's not forget the women. We just heard a wonderful song about the women. In his genealogy, Matthew names four other women, and yet they are not the model matriarchs we expect. Not Sarah, not Rebecca, not Rachel, not Leah. Whom do we find? Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. Women all, Gentile women, women whose own stories were stained with shame for varying reasons. Tamar, the story of Judah's fornication. Rahab, a Canaanite prostitute. Ruth from the cursed people of Moab. And Bathsheba, Uriah's wife, whom David seduced. These two were all Jesus' ancestors. Are you shocked? We shouldn't be, because Jesus came to save sinners. Martin Luther, the great reformer, once reflecting on the infancy of Christ, says, you know, Christ is the kind of person who is not ashamed of sinners. In fact, he puts them in his family tree. Indeed, the Son of God did not become man to live on a pleasant street. Christ came into the world 
a broken world, an impoverished world, a hard-hearted dog-eat-dog world, a world that walks in darkness still, a world where people break other people's hearts, a world where we hate and are hated. Jesus came to that world, our world, and he came to save us, to save you, to save me, to change us and to make us new. So let me ask you, have you run from God? Are you running from God? Have you run in the wrong direction? Do you know yourself as a sinner and that you cannot save yourself? Do you know you need a savior and it must be this savior, Jesus? Oh, put your trust in him now. And if you are already a Christian and have come to trust in Christ, but find yourself now caught in sin, never forget that Christ is the king who saves sinners, even sinful Christians. So turn to him. Confess your sins to him. He is your advocate with the Father. Finally, Matthew's genealogy tells us that Jesus is not only the promised king and the king who saves sinners, but he is the king who has come to bring a new beginning. Do you know the story of the Benomarian people? There are people that were plagued by the ruinous beliefs of their own idolatry, such as cannibalism, constant warring with neighboring tribes. So hopeless were they that many of their women actually used abortifacients so that they could never bear children because they said, why bring children into this world? They had dwindled down to just just a few hundred people. They were a people where deceit among them was considered a virtue. For several years, Des and Jenna Oatridge had labored to convert the Benomarian people of Papua New Guinea. And they had translated some of Matthew's gospel for them in their Benomarian language. But it didn't seem to take root. The Benomarian people remained locked in their ancient idolatrous ways. One was tempted to ask, where is God? Has God's word failed? But a new day came for a freshly minted and printed complete gospel of Matthew. And Des picked up and began to read Matthew from the very beginning. And no sooner did he begin that the people became deadly silent around him. At first he was actually a bit scared, concerned. Soon more and more people from the village crowded into the room and people drew near to his face and he could see that their faces had the look of astonishment. Suddenly, someone cried out, why didn't you tell us this story was real, that Jesus was true? No one bothers to write down the name of the ancestors and spirit beings. It's only real people who record their genealogical table. Jesus must have been a real man on this earth. (laughs) And now it was the Western missionaries' turn to be surprised. For when they originally had printed Matthew's abridged edition, guess what part they left out? The genealogy. But now with the knowledge that Jesus Christ was real, real change came to them. Their population grew. This was a new beginning for a lost tribe. Here was no myth. Here was fact. Here they saw that God truly had entered time and space and taken to himself our nature, our flesh, body and blood. That God had sent 
a Savior who really saves us. Listen, you will not find a genealogy in the Quran. And the Buddhist Tripitaka, you will not find one. Or the Hindu Mahabharata or the Bhagavad Gita. Only here in this Bible will you find a genealogy because our God, the triune God, is a real God who sent a real Savior, even Jesus. And because he's the real God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because he's the real son of David and the son of Abraham, Jesus is the God of the living and not the dead, the God-man of new beginnings. And isn't that what Matthew has been saying all along? For that very opening word, the book, could, book of the genealogy could easily be translated, the book of the genesis of Jesus Christ. Matthew is proclaiming the past, our past, your past, has been erased, forgiven through faith in Jesus Christ and replaced with a new beginning. Does not the apostle Paul say as much, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Do you believe that? With the coming of Jesus, there is promise of new life, a new beginning, a new start, even for Christians too. That's the surprise of God's grace. Remember that story of Roy Rigel's wrong way, Roy? Well, I didn't finish the story. At the half, the team returned to the locker and waited in dreaded silence. Over there on the floor sat the fool, wrong way Roy, head between his knees, playing over and over again in his mind the folly of his life, running in the wrong direction. But then the silence was broken. Coach Nib Price proclaimed one word. He simply said, uh, the same team that started the first half will start the second half. And there was surprise in the locker room. Really? Even Rigels? It was something even Rigels couldn't handle. Co Coach, I can't do it. I've ruined you. I I've ruined myself. I've ruined you, see. Coach Price just replied, Roy, get up and go back there. The game is only half over. Brothers and sisters, Matthew 1 is telling us this is not the end of the story. It's but the beginning. Matthew is telling us that the game now is only half over. Christ has come. And now begins the second half as we wait and work and labor until Christ's return again. Listen, all of us here who are listening, all of us who are listening, we've run in the wrong direction. But the story of Jesus Christ, the story of the promised king, the king who saves, is the story of the king of new beginnings. It's the story of the promise that doesn't depend on you or me. It's the story that belongs to God, and God is faithful. Our triune God always keeps his promise. Today, God says to each of us, take heart. Christ has come. The game's not over. I've given you a new beginning. So let that new beginning begin each day by faith in the name above all names, even Jesus, who has come to save us from our sins. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you this day for your word that you keep true and have kept true in the sending of your son, Jesus Christ, and his life, death, resurrection, and ascension, and session now at your right hand. And now, Lord, as you remind us that we're in the second half, that our labor is not in vain, let us labor on until you come again.
for you will keep your word. Blessed be your name. Amen. Amen.